Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco. And thanks for joining us at the Page One Podcast, where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing process, how they got into the industry, and get as many hints and tips on writing as possible. Uh, this is episode 58, unbelievably, as Tarek says. Ooh, um, I thought we'd make it this far. Exactly. So there's a huge back catalogue of some really great writers, authors, screenwriters, comic writers, video game writers journalists so um please do check out the past episodes uh, i'm sure there'll be some names that you're you're interested in hearing from and um this week we've got a debut author on the podcast we do this week we are chatting with ali reynolds whose debut novel shiver has just been launched at time of recording mm-hmm. it's a kind of murder mystery locked room uh, story set in the uh, in the uh, ski resort, mm-hmm. and, which is very important because Ali herself used to be a top ten snowboarder, freestyle yeah. snowboarder, top ten in the UK. It's pretty yeah. cool. That's right. Yeah, we speak to her about that and how spending a lot of time up mountains injured gave her a lot of time to <laughs> to do writing. Um, time to think about plots. Exactly. Writing. So uh, yeah, we speak to her about her whole journey and and how and it was a very long journey to publishing. You know, she's she started writing, I think she says, uh, 20 years ago. Um, not Shiver, but a different story. But, you know, so she's she's been working at it for a long time. And then, as ever, suddenly, overnight success, 10 publisher auction for Shiver, That's the, the dream, debut, which is amazing. Um, but there's been a long path to get there, and we talked to her all about that. And you'll hear that she was uh, on the Curtis Brown course, which I think a mm-hmm. few of our guests have been on now, and it does seem to be quite a good tool of meeting other authors, getting instruction from people who are working in the industry. And it, it does seem like quite a useful. useful yeah, course. D- definitely. You know, these. There's no doubt. I mean, I have to say, when I when we started recording these podcasts, I was slightly cynical about these courses. How yeah. much can they teach you, and all this sort of stuff? But you know, as we've spoken to so many successful authors. You know, not just the Curtis Brown course, but lots of other writing courses that people have been on. They they clearly are valuable. They do teach you yeah. something. They, you know, you may be able to write, but I think they teach you a discipline. They teach you a structure. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that isn't maybe inherent in or in a lot of uh, what people do. And I think they also just give you contacts as well. You know, yeah, you're, absolutely. You're in that yeah. world of agents and editors, which is which mm-hmm. is a it's a it's a way in. It's, it's a foot in the door to that world, which is hard to get in otherwise. And a, and a lot of them give you credibility as well when you're approaching yeah. agents as well. If you've done some of these courses, then yeah. it shows that you take it seriously, um, and and makes it more likely that the agent will look at the material you're submitting. But anyway, uh, we'll get straight into the podcast after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, the page one notebook. And then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy-to-use sections that will help you plan your story, 
so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project. Whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story, we truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. I think it's fair to say you had an unusual route into into becoming a writer. You, you I think, were a, a snowboarder and have had <laughs> various other jobs along the way. Yes, I, I have had a lot of jobs. I think I've had about 30 or 40 jobs. And I'd, I'd say that's that's kind of given me an advantage as a writer because it sort of you learn about different things. I've always been trying to be a writer, but it's just taken me and until now in my 40s to actually get there <laughs> and um was so you said you always wanted to be a writer so that was always yeah. the main goal uh, throughout um, all of this I, I think I didn't think I'd be able to actually make a living from it so uh, I kind of I was always trying to write um since I was about 18 I was mm. first trying quite seriously to write novels and um, then you know obviously doing whatever other jobs and whatever things that were going on in my life. Um, when I was snowboarding I remember I had this um, word processor because it's it was 20 years ago so you know laptops weren't that common then and they were quite expensive so I had this little word processor that had a little screen that was about five lines deep. <laughs> and, um, so you Tap on that, and I, I think you could edit very briefly within those five lines, and then print it out. Wow! <laughs> so I would actually write, you know, in the winter storms or when I had injuries, I would sit there in my little, you know, apartments. So I was kind of the weird snowboarder that was really bookish and <laughs> loved writing as well. It's a bit unusual, I'd say. But, but you weren't yeah. just a snowboarder. You were, am I right in saying you were in the top ten halfpipe snowboarders? At one point? It, it was in very much in the early years of freestyle snowboarding. So um, I, I did make the top 10 in the UK. Um, the, there were possibly maybe only 10 women competing at that time in <laughs> half And um, yeah, so it was quite a new sport. Um, yeah. Go so was it, was it something that you're obviously very good at and you were having a lot of success at? And so, but the, the kind of, this urge to write was still something that you that you were like, I'm still going to put all this to one side and, and go after the, after the writing. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's. I think the the snowboarding at the time was something. Yeah, I had you know dreams of maybe making the Olympics. Um, mm. But yeah, at the same time, I knew that would be really hard. The writing fit with it quite well because you know a lot of the time you're holed up inside with you know winter weather and bad yeah. storms and um injured so you're not able to move around or maybe the lifts are closed because it's um you know high winds and snowstorms so yeah I was always sort of doing that in the evenings and it, I, the book I was writing at the time was set in the mountains okay so it was kind of very much inspired by this dangerous high mountain setting mm -hmm. where I was but it wasn't Shiva. It was it was a previous project that still hasn't quite got there yet. Right, still still <laughs> there potentially to be released one day, perhaps. Yes, I hope that I will go back to it. Um, I I spent twenty years on and off with uh -huh. that project, um, and yeah, I, I think I haven't given up on it yet, but. <laughs> 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 I'm hoping it, it won't be my next book. But it, it may possibly be a, a third or a fourth book. I'm actually mm. hoping to give it to my agent to read through at some point, and I'm hoping she'll do a story doctoring mm. job on it. Um, my agent, Kate Burke, is really, really great story doctor. She sort of has helped me so much with Shiva to look at the big picture yeah. and pointed out, you know, what I needed to do to to get it to you know the product that it is, it is now i mean that's that's a, it, we're sort of jumping ahead but i mean that is yeah. a role that um the agents that you know if you're if you're starting out in writing you know you need an agent to yeah. get a publishing deal <clears throat> but i don't think many people appreciate that agents 
almost act as your first editor as well and can really make some change, suggestions that can lead to big changes in the work that you've got. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I don't know if all agents do that, but that was probably the number one thing um, that I was really hoping to find in an agent mm. because I knew as a debut writer that if I could find somebody that could, you know, give me editorial advice like that, I'd have a, you know, it would be a major advantage. And yeah, I, that was one reason that I was really drawn to submit to Kate in the first place. I saw she had, I think, 10 years of editorial experience working at a large publishers before mm -hmm. she became an agent. So, yeah, that was a reason for her. Cool. Yeah. And, and yeah. as well as writing, uh, so you were, you were, while you were snowboarding you on this word process, you were writing a novel. But I think yeah. um, you've also written uh, some short stories that appeared in magazines and things like that. Did that? help you make the step into getting your your publishing deal um i would say it helped a little bit but more it helped me very much um try out lots of different genres mm -hmm. um edit um, because when you're writing for women's magazines you're very much writing to certain um word counts yeah and you're honing every single word there's um, there's massive competition to get into the women's magazine. It's a very small market these days. Mm -hmm. So I knew my chances were really, really slim. So I would spend hours editing each piece. Mm -hmm. So I got a bit of the editing practice. Um, also with story, I think short stories let you play around a lot um, with storylines, you know, twists, mm -hmm. um, yeah, different points of view. Um, yeah, I feel like it helped me a lot to sort of learn as a writer. And I suppose it can help you if you've got these ideas. You know, we've, we've spoken to some people that have written a short story that's even been published, but then they've sort of taken, if not the whole short story, they've taken aspects, maybe a character or a theme, mm -hmm. and pulled that out and, and turned that into a much longer novel at a later stage. So it can be a good sort of proving ground for that sort of thing as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I only began writing the short stories um, about 15 years ago. So before that, there were, I'd say, four, maybe four different novels that I, you know, attempted. Mm -hmm. And each time I would get typically to, you know, 70,000, 80,000 words. Um, but I couldn't get them completed. And I never got them completed to a state that I was happy with them. And I felt that they were ready to submit to anybody. Often I got sort of a bit lost in the storyline. Either I did, couldn't find an ending that I felt that worked. Mm -hmm. Or it started off as one thing and went off in a weird direction that I hadn't expected. And so, was that the kind of impetus for why you did the uh, the Curtis Brown creative novel writing course? Because I, I know we've chatted to a few folk who did that course and they've all spoken quite highly about it. And was it, was it something that was that something that you did because you wanted to kind of get that final bit of push to help wrap up all these novels that you were trying to write? Um, well, it, it, it was definitely the, the first, I've done three of their short online uh, six week courses mm -hmm. and yeah, they were excellent. I would certainly recommend them. The first course I did, um, I was trying to get my previous project, which was this one that I was doing for 20 years, set in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to sort of get over the line, get some up-to-date advice from a literary agency about submission and mm -hmm. pitching it. And, yeah, it was really helpful. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you said you've got this, the different novel in that course, but that's one that you're hoping to still resurrect. What about the other ones? Are, are some of them just put them in a drawer, good exercise, I, I but never look at it again? <laughs> um, I think that um, because it was over a period of about 20 years, um, obviously, like a lot's happened in my life and I, my tastes have changed. Mm -hmm. My reading tastes have certainly changed over the time. I think the market has changed a lot. Yeah. Um, I was quite into um, science fiction and fantasy a long time ago. And then um, I, I like chick lit. And um, then I sort of moved to thrillers and got totally hooked on thrillers. 
and crime. I've, I've I'm always been a massive reader and mm-hmm. I've read pretty much every genre there is, but sort of mm-hmm. moving through them. And my writing has sort of taken the same sort of pattern. So some of the early uh, novel attempts were kind of chiclet um, with a little bit of romance and some humour in there, always um, with um, different settings. Um, I really am drawn a lot to foreign settings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope that I might be able to use aspects of them, Um, maybe the settings or certain characters. I'm not sure that... There's three of them. I don't think, yeah, we'll yeah. ever see. Yeah, <laughs> then, you know, when, you, sort of when, you, when you're working on, on all these novels, and you kind of get to a point and you say, no, it's just not, it's not, it's not going to work anymore. You know, yeah. you kind of thing. I'm going to put this to one side for for a while. That's that's quite hard because you know we've all worked on novels and and tried to make it work for so long. And and how do you know for sure when an, an idea or a novel just isn't going to work and you know, how do you know this needs more work or this just needs to be put to one side? Well, what's what's the difference there? Yeah, I think it, it's very hard to know. Um, I think on one hand, you don't want to give up too easily because mm-hmm. that's not going to get you anywhere. But on, on the other hand, it can be hard to give up on something that you've spent hours and hours and maybe years on. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, sometimes that meant getting advice from somebody else um i've been in a a group of um a few writers for about 15 years and we've all sort of read and commented on each other's work and i really trust their opinions they've they've given me some really great advice so that was something that helped um i was really lucky enough about three years ago um to be accepted into a mentoring scheme for women writers by women writers and it was called the Women Mentoring Scheme. I sadly think it's not running anymore but um, thriller writer Angela Clark was kind enough to mentor me and she did a full read of my previous uh, project, this mountain set project Mm -hmm. and um, gave a sort of big picture um, sort of review of what was going on and um that advice was just amazing it just made me see what was wrong with it Mm -hmm. and um yeah it it gave me the incentive to give up (laughs) for now (laughs) and put it aside because i could see it needed major major work Mm -hmm. and then start afresh on a new project yeah it's that sort of mix isn't it because you've worked on something for so long that you are reluctant you know you're very close to it you're reluctant to to give up on it but at the same time there is you know a project can get to a stage where it's just it becomes such hard work to try and fix it whereas starting something afresh if you've got a new idea can be quite a quite an out you know quite a release from that sort of difficult um, process so um, I mean and I obviously worked with with Shiver how, how did you get your agent uh, Kate that you mentioned earlier yeah. how, how did that happen um, so yeah just through um, the normal submission process really um, I had heard of a website called Jericho Writers and they had an agent search tool called Agent Match so you could enter what type of, uh, what genre it was and which country was it, the US or UK, where you were looking for agents. And um, so it brought up a big list of agents. And then I researched each agent really carefully. I looked at their client list. I looked for interviews um, to see, you know, what their interests were and mm-hmm. what kind of things they liked, if they were actively taking on clients or if they had a big, huge list and maybe they were too busy. Mm -hmm. um so um yeah then I drew up a short list of people to submit to I saw that Kate said she liked cold bleak settings so that was one reason I thought it was quite a good fit for for her and yeah and and when you were doing that submission process again this is something that when you're starting out can be a bit opaque you know I think a lot of agents say don't submit you know, submit one at a time, but that can be difficult because then they can take weeks, if not months, to get back to you, and sometimes they don't even get back to you. Um, did you did you do multiple submissions at a time, or 
I did. I sort of, I wasn't sure about whether I should do one or many. And I sort of tried to read up on the subject, what different other writers had done. Mm -hmm. And the general consensus seemed to be to submit to a few at a time. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be that agents these days generally expect that you might submit to a few other agents Uh um, at a time because you could be waiting months. Yeah. Um, or you might not even hear back from them for for whatever reason at all. So I think I submitted to about four agents the first time. Um, I got, um, so I'm in Australia with a time difference. Um, I remember I would wake up in the morning and check my emails (laughs) eagerly, and um, I got three very rapid rejections Uh um, with just within a day or two for my first set of submissions and yeah it's devastating Mm -hmm. totally devastating Mm -hmm. you know um but then um i one thing that helped me i saw um a competition for the first chapters of a crime competition it was um it was the debut daggers um, writing competition that they have each year and you had to submit i think three thousand words maybe So um, I figured I would have a go at submitting, but the place where I really wanted to end that 3,000 words, I wanted to end on a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. And that actually meant cutting and trimming um, my my first chapters quite a lot um, in order to cram in that cliffhanger at the end. Yeah. So I trimmed and cut, and I think I chopped about 1,000 words. So I trimmed it by about a quarter maybe. And then um, submitted it to the competition where, where I didn't get, you know, anywhere. <laughs> but um, I submitted those trimmed chapters to another four agents. And, um, yeah, within 24 hours, I was getting requests for full manuscripts. Brilliant. So wow. for me, that's something that really helped, the, the trimming and the cutting ruthlessly. So mm-hmm. you're questioning every single word. Do you need that adjective? Do you, mm-hmm. do you need two adjectives together? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it cleaned it up maybe. Well, that's 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 mm-hmm. interesting, and because I think, yeah, it's those those initial rejections, the the quick ones are always the worst because they always come back and you think, have you actually read it properly? <laughs> yeah. Did you just <laughs> someone put you off the cover letter? I don't know what I did wrong here. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's that's interesting the fact that you then cut a thousand words off and that seemed to just really sharpen up the writing and probably give it room to to breathe or to pop or whatever and maybe um, and, yeah, yeah and... I, I, think that it, I, I, I was looking at each sentence and questioning if i really need it and i was also think i'd heard that agents get an average of about ten thousand submissions a year so i was picturing all these agents with their you know massive in, you know amount of submissions waiting in their inbox and i imagine them probably just looking for the the first excuse to yeah. say no and move on to the next one Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I thought if you've trimmed it right up, you know, try to give them yes, no, nothing to find wrong with it. Yeah, and, yeah I think know, that must be right. I think there must be that initial filtering process, which is so you're trying to do something in your cover letter or your synopsis that does make it stand out and makes it jump jump out to the to the top of the pile, hopefully. So I mean that was that was how you got your agent for a shiver, which then I think went into a ten publisher auction, which must have been very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> that, that that was just unbelievable because, you know, I I had been dreaming about being a writer for, you know, since I was 18, so for more than 20 years. And you, mm. you always sort of hear in newspapers or on the news, you know, of books going to auction. So it's sort of, you know, the ultimate dream. You never once imagined that it would happen to you, Mm -hmm. you know. (laughs) And then for it to be 10 publishers, I mean, I I didn't even know that 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 was possible. Mm -hmm. So that that whole sort of phase from about a year ago, I'm really, I'm still in a daze actually. (laughs) Like now it's like 15 months on from there now. And yeah, I'm just... I feel like I might wake up and it's not really happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, why don't you tell us about the book, Shiver, what, what, what the setting of it is, what, what the plot of it is, without giving away any spoilers, of it, of course. Okay. <laughs> so um, the book is set in the French Alps in a tiny ski resort. Um, it's a fictional resort because I needed certain qualities. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has a dual timeline. 
and um, it's set between 10 years ago and then in the present day. So it starts in the present day with the characters, um, they're former athletes and they've received an invitation to a reunion at this ski resort where they used to train 10 years ago and um, they haven't been back to this resort since then because tragedy struck and they've tried to sort of move on but they receive this invitation and they feel compelled to go it's the off season so uh, they go up the cable car and as they go up the cable car it's a long ride up to the glacier where the reunion venue is as they go up they they get chatting and there's confusion over who invited them Hmm. and um, when they get to the top they find the building dark and deserted and a game has been laid out for them an icebreaker game and the game will reveal some some things that they didn't want anybody to know and then we gradually learn that 10 years ago uh, they were athletes competing for a half pipe competition in the in the snow park the snow park the half pipe there at the resort and um they were young, they were in their early 20s. And um, so we've got some some siblings, some best friends, and mostly they're rivals. And, um, and then tragedy strikes. So they're all um, trapped there in the present day and their past is coming back to haunt them. Brilliant. Nice. It sounds like a really kind of up-to-date uh, spin on the kind of murder mystery locked room type type story yeah. you get with like Agatha Christie type type tales yeah it's it's very much that sort of yeah murder mystery um mm-hmm. when I pitched it to my agent I pitched it to as and then there were none on a glacier with snowboarders nice. um, <laughs> it looks quite a lot at rivalry uh especially female female rivalry Mm-hmm. Um, like how 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 far would you go to win, and which way would you choose if yeah. you're if you're forced to choose between your friendship and and winning? And is, is there an element of the old sort of writing cliche of write what you know? There, you know, do you, do you believe in that? Because obviously, this one has snowboarders, um, and the one that you the novel that you spoke about previously was also set on the mountain and things like that. So, do you think it's important to? bring elements of your own experience into a story that you're writing? I think it's certainly a lot easier to write what you know. I I would imagine that a lot of debut novelists um, write what they know. Mm -hmm. They might write uh, fiction set in the work environment where they used Mm -hmm. to work. And you can create quite an authentic voice, maybe an authentic, you know, workplace setting, or maybe it's a country that you lived in. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got that knowledge of the culture and, you know, the, the vivid um, vi- visual details of how it was. But maybe after your second or third book, probably you run out of things that you could write about that you know yeah. about. So I would imagine then you would probably have to start researching. And, uh-huh. Yeah, I think that would be that's something that I imagine would be pretty hard to do. So I'm always quite in awe of writers that manage to do that and research, you know, a completely different job or a completely different country. It is crazy. Some some authors just pump out so many high high end books, you know, a year, and you think, how do you find the time to, yeah, as you see, to learn this kind of area which you've obviously never worked or yeah. lived in? But yeah, and 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 when yeah. you were writing um, Shiver, what was it that made this book work where your previous ones hadn't? You think? <laughs> So I, I would say, yeah, no, I would say two things um, that, that I did differently with Shiva. Um, one thing was um, before I started writing Shiva, I figured my weakness was story. So um, I, and I've never actually had much formal writing education. I did, mm-hmm. fo- I did foreign languages at school, mm-hmm. so I didn't mm-hmm. actually study English even at A level. I haven't got... Um, an English degree or a creative writing masters or anything. Yeah, I'd love to get that one day. But um, yeah, I've got very little formal um, 
English. So I went out and got my hands on pretty much every book on writing that I could find and read it and studied it and made notes and tried to apply it to my different projects. And yeah, it was very, very helpful. Um, and the other thing that I did differently that I had never done with my previous attempted novels, um, I planned Shiva. So the other novels I didn't plan at all. And I, I figured that was where I'd gone wrong because I would end up with the storyline in a, in a huge mess mm -hmm. or not find an ending at all. So uh, with Shiva, um, I spent a whole month actually planning it without actually writing a single word of the narrative. I had the basic idea yeah. and um, the setting. I, I very much wanted to have it as a sort of closed, you know, a locked room setting trapped mm -hmm. on a mountain. Mm -hmm. And then I was I figured out the, who I would like the characters to be. And um, one of the books on writing I'd read had talked about a character web. Right. So I sort of that that to me, I had this idea a bit like a spider's web, if mm. you can picture that. So I got a sheet of A4 paper and I, I put my five or six main characters on it and I was drawing lines um, between them to show the relationships and the conflict. Mm -hmm. And another thing I learned from one of the writing books was to try to aim for as much conflict between the characters as possible. So um, I had my characters 10 years ago and then I had my characters now. Mm -hmm. And, for example, one of them was the boyfriend of this girl 10 years ago. And in the present, she has a different boyfriend. So what are those two guys going to feel about each other? Those guys are best friends. Yeah. But in a way, they were competing over her. And they were competing for um, as professional snowboarders as well. So I just tried to draw in as much conflict as I could between all of those characters. And um, then I had some ideas for scenes um, in both of the timelines. And I plotted out my scenes onto little post-it notes. Right. I'd seen it recommended on online. Quite a few writers apparently do this. Mm -hmm. So you get just a very brief uh, outline of a few lines long of what mm -hmm. will happen in that scene. And so I've got a giant whiteboard that's taller than I am. <laughs> so the next stage of the planning was putting these scenes on the whiteboard. And I decided that I would alternate between the present and the past timeline. So I'll start off in the, pa uh, in the present and show the characters in this predicament mm -hmm. and then cut back to, you know, how they meet 10 years ago. And then we cut forward again to show them you know, moving through their predicament a little and then cut back to show them a certain event that happened in the past. And I would spend sometimes all day just shuffling my little scenes around <laughs> to try to find the best order and then yeah. adding in new scenes. I knew I probably would need, you know, 70 to 80 scenes, I think is about typical mm -hmm. for books because I'd gone through some of my favourite thrillers and analysed them, looked at how many scenes they had um scenes are really different to chapters as well chapter might have just one scene or several scenes so yeah. that was another thing i had to figure out later i mean it, so, it sounds yeah, I, yeah go ahead no i was just going to say it sounds like quite a quite a sort of almost scientific approach to to you know to yeah. constructing the story there um but but yeah. obviously it, it, compared to the sort of you know, uh, I think they call it pants, and you know, writing by the seat of your pants yeah. approach that you had previously. It it obviously helped bring that that structure to mm -hmm. the story that was, and, and I think with a story like this, where you've got different timelines and twists and things like that, it, writing that but that sort of story by the seat of your pants would be very very difficult. I think without having. And I think some out. writers do do that. Yeah, yeah I, I think in crime and thrillers. Um, because, yeah, we do have maybe quite complicated plots mm -hmm. often and maybe different timelines. I think many writers do plan mm -hmm. to some extent. But mm -hmm. then I've also heard of others that don't and even they don't know the ending as they start writing it. And uh, mm -hmm. that amazes me. I know I couldn't do that. I know from experience, from trying and failing over 20 years, that I'm not a pantser. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, for me, planning is is 
what helped. I don't think I plan as much as some writers. I've heard of writers spending up to a year planning different books wow. or writing more detailed outlines. Mm -hmm. uh, my outlines were only, you know, a few sentences long. When you um, are writing a book like this where you're jumping back and forth in time and you've got all these characters and stuff, um, you know, is it, I think I'd read somewhere that you, you found it important to end on a cliffhanger as often as possible. You know, every time you cut away from a scene, you want to leave people want, wondering what's going to happen next. And is that, obviously that's part of the planning process as, as, as well, but is that something that's really important to you think always leaving a hook? So there's always a reason for the author, for, for the reader to go back to the book to find out what happens next. Yes, for me, that was really, really important. Um, I'm a massive reader, particularly of like the, the latest release thrillers. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at some of my favorite authors, um, what they do, end of scenes. And yeah, that happens very much. And it, it makes you desperate to read on. Mm -hmm. I, I remember looking, I, I read at the time, uh, Jane Harper's Force of Nature. Yeah, and I was I looked at her uh, scene and chapter endings, and they're incredible. There's a, a sort of shock or a sense of threat mm -hmm. or a question, or yeah, we're, we're left in a sense of suspense about what might happen next. So that was yeah. definitely something I tried really hard to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I was trying to find some some kind of link between the present and the past. So that when you jump, it doesn't throw the reader too much. Mm. So, for example, one of my present tense scenes will end with the character in bed. And then in the past timeline, she wakes up in someone else's bed. So it's, we've got some kind of little link yeah, or yeah. some difference. Yeah, It's sort of like mm -hmm. a sort of feed cut in a film kind of a thing where you, you would fade exactly. out. And, that, yeah. That's how I feel. Yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you're writing a sort of thriller, you you want the reader to be going through that sort of, oh, I'll just read one more chapter, just one more, you know, yeah. to yeah. hook them on to keep, suddenly it's 3 a.m. and they're they're still reading the book. Um, and when, yeah. you, when you're writing, so you, you do this plan, but it's not too detailed, which I think we've heard from a lot of our guests that they don't want to plan something out in too much detail because then it kind of takes away from the spontaneity of actually writing the, the, the story itself. But you've got the, the, the main parts, the main scenes, you've got everything, the idea of it, the structure there. But do you redraft? Do you write a whole um, draft of the novel, or do you redraft as you're going along? Yeah, I very much redraft as I go along. So I'm I'm a total technophobe. I'm really old school. I write everything on pen and paper. Right. Good old pen and paper. And um, before that, generally, what I'll do, I find, I will try to imagine how each scene would play out in my head. So I'll often do that in bed at night when I'm supposed to be trying to sleep, mm -hmm. or if I wake up early. And then I'll have the scene play out in my head. So I've got a really clear idea of what's going to happen, you know, how it's going to look. And then I'll write it longhand, um, usually just a scene or two. And then I will type it up uh, in Word. So that sort of becomes the second draft yeah. in a way. And then each time I add more scenes, I will usually go back over the earlier scenes. So by the time I've got to the end, the start will have been edited, you know, hundreds of times. Yeah. So it's a really slow way to work. And I'd say it's got advantages and disadvantages, but I, I can't work any other way because I have to keep fiddling with it. Uh, um, I'm a really messy writer, I would say. Like the first draft is just appalling. I wouldn't want anybody <laughs> at all to see it. And it just, I would say it's kind of like, you know, a sculptor, you've got this messy, horrible lump of rock and then you're just chiseling away at it. You're chipping away these words and you're hoping that eventually it will shape up into something that, you know, is okay, something that you've wanted. But the, the know, start with it, <laughs> some of our Some of our guests have sort of said, you know, that they'll just write and they'll just want to get to the end of the novel. And that includes even getting to scenes and they'll just sort of say, this happens here, and they'll just skip on and then move on to the next bit and keep keep going that way. And I, I'm, I'm much more like you, I think, in the sense that I, I can't... My brain won't let me do that. I want to kind of sort out 
because I'm already thinking ahead to when I get back to that and have to then write it. I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> yeah. like, no, I want to try and yeah. sort this out now so that it's easier yeah. when I come back to it for a redraft. I think of. I think for my brain as well, when was I, I struggle with with that whole you know this scene insert this scene later and then and then leap ahead because for me I was kind of think if I don't want to write that scene now you know is that because I kind of know subconsciously subconsciously the scene shouldn't be there or it's going down a yeah. way that. I don't really want it to go, so I'll skip over it. I'll force it in later. And if, if I'm fighting against it, I kind of wonder if it's just going in, in, in the right way. So I, I struggle with that as well. Yeah, that sounds like totally right. That Because um, I tried that with my third attempt of a novel. I remember I just thought I'll write whatever scenes I want to write and then maybe piece them all together afterwards and put them in some sort of order. And it did not work at all because I had all big <laughs> missing bits that I felt yeah. you know too bored to write, and the, yeah, they probably, like you say, should not have been there at all. Um, so yeah, that didn't work for me at all. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I remember Anna Davis on the Curtis Brown course um, made a point of it, it was the edit and pitch short course. She mm -hmm. said, you know, when you've got your final, you know, draft, um, when it's all there, you need to look at every single scene and question what does that scene do does it actually advance the story um otherwise maybe you don't need it so you've got to question every single scene even if it's an, an interesting sort of scene it might not make the story you know move forwards in any way so maybe yeah yeah it's, it's <laughs> that sort of a uh, kill your darlings type idea isn't yeah. it that you can have written a very nice scene but it doesn't actually advance the story at all so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't need to be yeah. in there um although you can I always pull it out and the... save it for something else i suppose yeah <laughs> i think on the other hand with my scene um even when i was sort of thought i had it all planned out um about six months into writing when i was you know more than halfway through i was adding scenes and you know thinking of new scenes Mm -hmm. And then um, a year later, when I was working with Kate um, in the sort of the first edit, um, that that work involved writing 12 more scenes and slashing other scenes. But um, I knew who that was. I knew sort of what the setup was. And, yeah, there was other things that, you know, as I wrote, that, that more, more ideas came along. Yeah. And, and now, of course... Shiver is out in uh, January 2021, uh, so not long yes. to go at time of recording. And are you pretty excited? Are you, you know, you it must be a, like a massive moment for you. This this book finally, finally coming out. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I'm super excited. It's it's kind of terrifying as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's coming out US and Australia and the UK. Uh, I think simultaneously. I think. Wow. Um, yeah, I'll be here in Australia kind of, yeah, watching what's happening in the, the launch in the UK. And, yeah, very, very exciting. And Yeah. <laughs> I suppose is, is this the point or the part of the process where you don't really have any control over it? You know, you've, there's so much of it that you, you control what the book is, what it's about, what happens, et cetera. But there comes a point when you have to just step back and say it's now up to the gods, the book gods, to see yeah, what happens with I it next. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so, because you just, you, you don't have any idea, like my publishers liked it, but will readers like it, you, you just mm -hmm. don't know how it's going to go down at all, it's, it's going to be very nerve-wracking, as I'm sure it is for every writer, you never quite know what the response will be, so yeah. <laughs> And uh, what are you what are you working on just now then? Uh, Shiver obviously is is due out in January, but are you working on something just now? Uh, well, I have a, a two book contract, and I have a deadline for my second book. Um, because of Corona, and I've actually just gone through a divorce as well. I've got two young children, so I am really really behind. Um, the year <laughs> hasn't really gone to plan. I've I've been doing quite a lot of. The revisions for Shiva took up quite a lot of time. Um, I've been doing a lot of social media and just kind of learning about technology and yeah. um, just all those other things to do with Shiva. So I'm very, very behind on book two. I just, as we as we speak now, I'm going to get started on it and I hope that I can catch up. Nice. What I found with Shiva was I spent about a month in planning and then the whole thing probably wrote the whole draft within about six months yeah. so oh, cool, okay. if I invest that planning time again in book two that I can yeah 
get it written in, in roughly that time frame but I just don't know I've wrote I've written my book I don't know if I can write another one <laughs> it's a horrible second thing. album isn't it where you've had all this time to get the first book ready and then suddenly you have a deadline for the second and you think crap yeah. I've that, same, that same magic again in a third of the time whatever, yeah. so all this year I've had second book syndrome I've been sort of off and on been working on book two trying to plan it and every idea I come up with or every sort of part of it seems some too similar in some way to shiver mm -hmm. so then I'll start that idea and then but then I don't know if I'm just being a bit too paranoid and yeah so <laughs> do, do you discuss the ideas for your next book with your agent or do you try and come up with it first and then pitch it to your agent almost like it's a, you know like you're trying yeah. to get a new agent again I mean I, I think it's my job to come up with the ideas but certainly then um I had about five or six different ideas for a possible book too. And yeah, I, I felt it was very important to run them past the agent. And actually then we will run them past the publishers as well, I think, to sort of see their take on it, um, you know, their preferences um, and, you know, how, how they think, how marketable they think, you know, different ideas would be or not be mm. or what's been done before. So, yeah, and, it, and that's... That's got sort of advantages and disadvantages, I would say. Like as yep. the, the first time you write the book, you're just some unknown writer. You're writing for yourself. You don't know if anybody except you will ever read it. So you've kind of got no pressure. You've got nobody looking over your shoulder. Um, and you're a bit more free in a way to, to sort of just write what you want to write. And then the second time around, yeah, it's quite different. And it's great to have this professionals to sort of get feedback from mm -hmm. but then it's quite nerve-wracking as well so yeah it is that thing that you know when you want to when you're aspiring or when you know when you're writing your book for yourself and try to get an agent and try to get a publisher like you say you've got that freedom to write whatever it is that you want to write um, but once you get an agent it does seem that um there is there there some restrictions do come into what you can write next. You know, we've spoken to a lot of authors and actually in crime, it seems to happen the most of all that if you've written a crime yeah. novel, then they want to say, right, we want another crime novel. Uh, whereas I think yeah. if you're more a sort of speculative author, you can, you know, you've got a bit of a wider playing field for your okay. next book. But I suppose okay. that makes sense from this point of view of, uh, you know, if people liked your book and bought it, they want to, make sure you write another book that those same people will come and buy and want to like, you know? Yes, I think that, that you as an author and, you know, the publishers are building up a brand. So mm -hmm. they're sort of yeah. setting up their expectations of what readers can expect when they pick up one of your books. So, yeah, and then maybe if you're on a contract, you, you might be on a two-book or a three-book contract. So definitely that's got to be the same. The, the thriller market, sometimes the authors after a number of thrillers go on to a different genre or maybe they have been writing in a different genre like chick lit or romance and then they've moved to write thrillers so it seems as though you can write a few books in that genre and then some of them do switch mm -hmm. and yeah you get yeah I, I love the idea of that like i definitely think something you know a long time in the future I, I would love to be able to have a go at some different genres as well mm -hmm. cool and would you would you be wanting to to branch into other other formats? Would you ever think about writing a screenplay or a comic book? I, I, well, screenplay is, is something maybe I, I haven't studied it at all. So mm -hmm. I think I would be you know I would be definitely interested in in studying that. Yeah. Um, maybe not a comic book and poetry. <laughs> then not really me, but yeah. <laughs> What was the last uh, movie that you saw? Oh, wow. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, so a movie I watched, I rewatched recently was Never Let Me Go. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, 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 love high, I love high concept books and movies. And yeah, just the concept of that, of that one had stuck in my head from a few years ago. So I rewatched it and yeah, it was just as good. Just, oh, nice. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> And uh, what was the last book that you read? Oh, I, um, just yesterday, um, I finished The Safe Place 
by Anna Downs. Uh, so she's an Australian, well, a, a Brit that moved to Australia. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was it's a thriller set in uh, a remote property. It's very creepy. What, what was the last TV series that you watched? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a really hard question. <laughs> what, one way that I managed to write Shiva was giving up TV. Oh, okay. Because um, as a mother of two small children, I was very, very time poor. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I would look at everything in my life that I could give up. And TV was sort of, you know, maybe you kind of watch for an hour or so each evening and I wouldn't have missed it too much. So yeah. I, I gave it up. Because giving up TV meant I could spend more time reading. Mm-hmm. So very so. little. I think I watched the news. <laughs> you, and that's something not to watch at the moment, I suspect. Yeah. yeah. I go for weeks without turning my TV on, though. So, yeah, I very much <laughs> read instead. And I wish I had more time for reading. And, again, with, with, with work and kids, this is always yeah. a time shortage. Cool. Um, well, the, the very last thing we always do is uh, either or. So there's... We will say there's no right or wrong answers apart from one okay. question. But <laughs> yeah. the uh, I'll, I'll I'll start with the first one. Uh, Wilkie Collins or Agatha Christie? Oh, Agatha Christie, easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we already know the answer to this one: TV or cinema? Yeah, well, I don't know about cinema these days. Yeah. I think that I'd be a bit scared <laughs> about cinema. I definitely um, films, movies, yeah. as, as yeah. I say here in Australia. I feel like I can watch, I can learn a lot, so much stories. And because the few times I have watched movies, I've kind of realized, oh wow, that's sort of yeah, I've, I've seen things about it. I've recently been rewatching a couple of the old um, psychological cool thriller movies uh-huh. like sleeping with the enemy yeah and um basic instinct yeah, and they're yeah. old wow they they are really good so, i mean yeah. there was there was a whole spate of those types of movies weren't there in the sort of 90s yeah. that they, they brought yeah. yeah they were very popular yeah, yeah. And, and maybe we're seeing them again as, as in the psychological thriller genre of these new released books yeah well. we've seen that's right. yeah maybe that's right yeah sort of Twisted round a little bit um, because mm-hmm. one thing for me um, that annoys me sometimes about crime fiction is often it's the females or the victims, and yeah. you know that they're afraid of males. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, I quite like that idea of the women being as dangerous as the men, or if not more so, because mm-hmm. y- you don't quite expect them to be dangerous sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, real book or ebook? Yeah, definitely a good old paper book. Um, I, I don't really like reading ebooks. I can see the advantage, you know, you can get them instantly. I did actually get a Kindle a month ago, but I, I just find it's quite a different experience. I find it hard to be from reading on the screen. I'm spending way too much screen time for my work. Mm-hmm. Paper seems a little bit easier on the eyes. I mean, you're dis- you've disappointed Tarek there because I think, apart from two guests, possibly <laughs> everyone says "real book." He's he's. Yeah, I'm afraid that, that was the wrong. Yeah. Made, <laughs> <Ali>. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and the, and the environment. It's an ebook. Yeah. Well, that's possibly yes. <laughs> um, uh, last one, and this is obviously yeah. a question for more normal times. But um, a fancy restaurant or a takeaway. Uh I'm in my 40s now, so yeah, probably a takeaway. You know, it's more <laughs> casual. Definitely, I'm not a fancy restaurant type of person. Um, yeah, I don't think I'd even have the clothes to go in. They, they might not let me. In the door. <laughs> but I've been in Australia too long in Queensland, so I'm I'm sort of in my my flip flops and you know, my my board shorts most of the year. So yeah, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Clock another win up to the real book column there. <laughs> Not that you're counting, Marco. <laughs> well, I don't need to count because <laughs> it's it's an overwhelming victory. We'll need to go up with some other thing that might be a bit closer, I think. I know, I do, I do feel it's a bit of a one-sided race at this point. Perhaps. Yeah, you never know. It, may, it has, the, recently there's been a few more e-book I know, lovers. it's a shame we've had so many rubbish guests on this. <laughs> we've had some better guests, some proper guests. Yeah, yeah, okay. People that like <laughs> e-books, in other words. Exactly, yeah. Um, well, uh, thanks very much to Ali for, for 
coming onto the podcast to talk about Shiver, which um, is a great book and it is just out. So highly recommend you go and pick it up. Um, one thing she mentioned there was the Jericho Writers website. That's how she found her agent. Um, they have a really, uh, and and I've looked at that website myself. It, it has a really useful agent match um, process that 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 you can type. You know, you can filter agents based on if they're growing their list, if they're established, if you know different types of genre and all this sort of stuff. So it's a good way of trying to filter down and find agents that way. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good tool, and because I think that's. You know, one of the hardest things is just finding who's out there, and it's easy to think there's not enough agents, but it is a very good tool to, to yeah, to to find quickly who's who's there and and who's who's open because so many times they're also they're they're not taking submissions on, so it's just a really it's a good time saver. So definitely recommend you. Yeah, and it's not the only one of its type. There are there are other ones out there as well, but we'll put a link to Jericho Writers in the podcast links in the podcast description and on the website just so you can check that out if you're interested. Yep. Um, and next week we continue our our debut author run with champion uh, the voices of debut writers exactly that says that's what page one podcast does <laughs> um with sherry jones who has her first book uh how the one-armed sister sweeps her house which is a uh, quite a harrowing tale uh, i think um but it's it's very well uh you know there's a lot of buzz about it and yeah. um it, she's won awards for her short stories and things like that so um that's another great chat next week. Uh, yeah, from she's an... quite an exciting uh, emerging voice, I think. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a really interesting chat we have with her. So, Yeah, so um, please do check that one out. And uh, as ever, before we go, I will quickly say, uh, if you enjoyed the episode, please do give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever other podcast app you use. Uh, and also uh, leave a review. And tell your friends, if you enjoyed it, get them to listen to it as well. Subscribe, follow, whatever. (laughs) Uh, All the numbers help us continue to get up the charts and uh, continue to get great guests on the podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below, hit that thumbs up button, and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UKPage1, as evidenced here and our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.